Before we begin, we'd like to take care of some housekeeping. So the slide that we have up is white with blue, green, and orange circles and highlights the following housekeeping items. We have our question and answer function enabled in the Zoom, but please note that there won't be a Q&A period or an extended Q&A period. Please only use the Q&A feature to raise accessibility or technical issues. And later in the event, we will invite you uh, your engagement by using Padlet, and we'll continue to share the Padlet link and pin it to the Q&A. Cart captions are available in our Zoom webinar or can also be accessed via a live stream. Use the QR code to access captions. We will also pin that link in the Q&A. Today we gather to celebrate the release of Lessons in Liberation, a multimedia toolkit that documents how educators, young people, organizers, and communities are building and practicing abolition in our schools and neighborhoods. This toolkit is a product of years of collaboration between the Education for Liberation Network and Critical Resistance with multiple other affiliated organizations, including the ones being shared in the chat. This slide includes headshots of the core members of our editorial collective. Christy Hernandez, Eric, Erica Miners, Farima Porkershid, Thomas Nikundiwe, Stefani Haptom, Corey Green, Alex Davis, Shaq Bellevue, Emily Bautista, and Emily Borg, and includes the AK Press logo. Beyond this beautiful toolkit and print, we are also still developing the accompanying Lessons in Liberation website and discussion guide, which will be coming soon. Now I'll pass it over to my comrade, Chrissy, to share a little bit more about this labor and love. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chrissy Hernandez. My pronouns are she and they. And I am a white skinned person with a short brown curly hair. Um, I'm wearing uh, snake earrings and a black and white shirt. I am currently a faculty member at CSUMB and in the managing editor of Lessons in Liberation, an abolitionist toolkit for educators. And I am so grateful to have been able to work with such an inspiring, dedicated and beautiful group of folks over the years. So uh, the slide that we have up is the cover of the Lessons in Liber of, of Lessons in Liberation um, on a white magenta, lavender, and yellow background with black text that reads available at akpress.org with a QR code. The cover depicts a person with dark brown skin, a short brown Afro hairstyle, black sunglasses, magenta sweater, blue pants, and a prosthetic limb who is gardening. A young person with brown skin and black braided shoulder length hair is kneeling at the foot of the garden bed, tending to the soil. Behind them, people are working on a mural that depicts activists with megaphones and fists raised in bright yellows and oranges. While we celebrate the release of Lessons in Liberation, we want to recognize the tremendous anti-racist work and resilience of educators during this time, including classroom teachers, paraeducators, community educators, teacher educators, parents, aunties, uncles, siblings, community organizers, youth, and neighbors who have been creating spaces for liberatory learning even before these unprecedented circumstances we're living in, as well as those with a new commitment to engaging in this urgent work. We also know that many viewers are involved in active campaigns around abolition in schools. So we encourage you to use the hashtag, hashtag lessons in liberation on social media to share any resources, campaign information, URLs for organizations, 
excuse me, reports, posters, and flyers. Today, we are coming together to reflect with our comrades about what it means to be returning back to schools in this political and unprecedented moment about why abolition is important to consider in relation to preschool through 12th grade education, what tensions arise when bridging abolition and education, and most importantly, what possibilities are available to us when we engage abolitionist teaching and organizing in and outside of schools. If you have the means, please consider supporting us by making a donation to the Education for Liberation Network or to Critical Resistance. Your donations help make this work possible. And uh, please consider donating, supporting the work. So for Education um, for Liberation Network, that is www.edliberation.org forward slash donate forward slash. And for Critical Resistance, that is criticalresistance.org forward slash donate forward slash ways uh, dash to dash give forward slash. Just want to go back to the slide that we were on showing the editorial collective uh, to make sure I name Carla Shalabi, who's also an important member of our team, whose name. I accidentally missed when I was previously naming everyone. Before we get our event started, I also want to acknowledge the stolen, occupied, unceded native land that each of us are joining the call from and ask that you take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous name of the land that you are on. I am calling, I'm joining this call from Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe lands in Toronto, currently known as Toronto. And if you do not know what indigenous land you are on, there is an app uh, that you can access on your phone and as well as a website called Native Land that will help you to locate the name of the indigenous land anywhere you go so that you can continue to show recognition and reverence to any occupied land that you are on. The website URL will be in the chat and I will spell it out now. N A T I V E dash l a n d dot c a we know that our work must always go beyond words and that we must act in solidarity with all first nations who are working to protect their land and people so in collaboration with this land acknowledgement we ask that you also join us in committing to take action to be in solidarity with all native people wherever you are the slide that we have up is white with the outline of a world map in gray. The title of the slide is Actionable Land Acknowledgement, and there are three square graphics, the logo, logo of Segura Tay Land Trust, the back profile of a woman with two long braids wearing a t-shirt that says rematriate the land, and a QR code. As the text on the slide reads, we can support rematriation and indigenous organizing in community locally with a donation, or we invite you to give to Segura Tay Land Trust to support their work to return indigenous land to indigenous people. The URL will be in the chat and I'll also spell it out. It is S-O-G-O-R-E-A-T-E dash L-A-N-D T R U S T dot O R G forward slash D O N A T E. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to our panelists, uh, Key Gross, Osceola Ward, and Holly Harden. Um, Dr. Bettina Love had a conflict and is unfortunately not able to join us tonight. Uh, this slide shows the headshots, names, and pronouns of our panelists. They will provide a visual self-introduction of themselves shortly. Also, a special shout out and thank you in advance to our ASL interpreters, 
Joe Toledo, Aaron Sanders Simon, Crystal Butler, and Cameron King, and to all of you for taking the time to be present online today. So I'm gonna go ahead and begin to introduce our wonderful panelists that we're so excited to be in conversation with tonight. So um, our first panelist is Holly Hardin, who is a white, queer, rural Southerner, making her current home in Durham, North Carolina as a middle grades public school educator. She currently teaches math and science to seventh and eighth graders in a multi-grade level project-based classroom. Her organizing work in schools has focused on issues of immigrant and racial justice, and she is proud of her work with Free Minds, Free People, including this summer's virtual conference, and monthly with the Zen Education Project's Black Freedom Struggle class. She is also committed to ongoing movement building and liberation work in community through her political home, Southerners on New Ground, or SONG. Akia Key Gross is an abolitionist, early educator, consultant, cultural organizer, and creative entrepreneur, currently innovating ways to resist, heal, liberate, and create with their pedagogy. Woke Kindergarten, a global abolitionist early learning ecosystem, supporting children, families, educators, and organizations in their commitment to an abolitionist early education and pro-Black and LGBTQIA plus liberation. Osceola Ward is a descendant of people that dreamed of freedom. Originally from East Palo Alto, California, he is committed to being a keeper of ancestral memory, working with and learning from youth in contexts as disparate as the backcountry, middle school classrooms, holding cells, and community gardens. He is now pursuing a doctoral degree in education. His research interests include Black grieving practices, histories of Black migration, and the role of memory in movements for transformative change in education. We're so excited to have these panelists with us. Now we get to get to the good stuff, having conversations with them. Uh, I'll pass it to you, Chrissy. Yes, thank you, Stephanie, and welcome to all of our panelists. We're so excited to be in conversation uh, with you tonight. So our order of speakers is going to be Holly, Key, and then Osceola. And our first question is going to allow us to dig a little bit into um, the work that you're all doing and the visions that inform that work. So our first question is, <clears throat> can you talk about your work in relation to abolition and education? What are the abolitionist visions of education that are at the center of your work? So again, can you talk about how your work, um, can you talk about your work in relation to abolition and education? And what are the abolitionist visions of education that are at the center of your work? And we'll, oh. And we'll go ahead and start with Holly. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here and thank you for being here tonight. Um, my name is Holly Hardin. My pronouns are she, her. I am coming to you from Shakori and Lumbee land in Durham, North Carolina. I am a white person with brown hair. I'm wearing a dark blue button up shirt with gold flowers. Behind me is a bookshelf with a diorama with sea creatures on top and a purple and black poster on the wall that says resilience. I'm a current middle school teacher in Durham Public Schools and I call Southerners on New Ground, which is a place for LGBTQ liberation across all lines of race and class in the South, my political home. And to answer the question, um, mostly it's my work as an organizer in multiracial and multi-class spaces in the South that I largely credit 
to forming my skills as an abolitionist teacher. In particular, campaign work, kinship building, and political development with groups like Southerners on New Ground and through mentors like Mary Hooks, Caitlin Breedlove, Paulina Helm Hernandez, and Kai Lumumba Barrow, who have all continued to push me to reflect on my own daily practices as a person and being willing to be transformed in the service of the work. It is that collective work that has taught me about being in community, being in struggle, vulnerability, and the importance of ritual and ceremony with each other. And it is through that transformation and vision of liberation in our lifetime that I come into my classroom every day. I think a lot about the growth, um, about a lot that a lot of my growth is continually being willing to be more vulnerable in communication and reflection with those around me, whether it's my colleagues or my students. I think over time, my work in the classroom has become less of like a separate performative space and more just part of my very being. And from that local organizing work, I've then sought out education spaces that hold similar, similar values, including Education for Liberation Network and Free Minds, Free People. Um, and I encourage any educator out there to find those communities of abolitionist educators in order to grow and reflect on their practice. Within my school system, I have worked to make sure to connect to my community and my union's work in order to not just limit my impact to an individual level, but to make collective shifts in attempts to make our larger school system um, and beyond a place of liberation too. I was born in and have chosen to stay in the South, which is a place full of hard contradictions, but also is a place that I think holds so much courage and noncompliance and resiliency in the face of historical oppression on people's bodies and on the land around us. For me, as an organizer um, and as a teacher, it's important that those lessons aren't lost both I think historically, but also when new issues in our communities arise. So when I think about the past years as a teacher, I think about a house bill in North Carolina that banned transgender students from using the bathroom. When a president was elected who told my students and their family that their families were less worthy than others. Or when a Confederate monument was toppled steps away from our schools, only to have reports of a KKK rally at the same site a few days later. I think about those events because I believe it's us as teachers who are on the front line responsible for fighting back and guiding our students to a place of understanding in those moments. And if I think back just a couple of years ago on the hills of Trump's election, um, when there was uncertainty about what was going to happen next, a group of teachers and community members, parents, um, we gathered to, to talk about, about what we needed to do for our students and in our schools. Um, and many of us had come together a few years before um, fighting um, in response to the fact that one of our own high schoolers, Wilda Nacosta, was kidnapped on the way to school by ICE. Um, so we had worked together before, um, in order to help bring him home, as well as other students from Georgia and North Carolina who were detained. Um, and in doing so, we shifted a dialogue in our community um, amongst our community leaders, our school officials, um, and, and city. And folks who hadn't previously been engaged around issues of immigration or even issues in the public school system were activated. Um, and a conversation, a new conversation centered on what community really means um, and made people rethink, uh, rethink ed immigration and created a new norm of how we protect all our residents, um, including some of our students who showed up at rallies, seeing their teachers and each other on the news, passing around petitions um, and more. And so with knowing we had that base already, knowing we had those folks together, after the election, um, we came together. We were worried and we came together. And we knew that if 
the Department of Homeland Security and ICE um, under Obama had no, had no reservations about disrupting our students' lives. We were particularly worried under, under Trump, um, who, who put his campaign around these anti-immigrant practices. Um, so as we started digging into what protections our schools offered our students, um, we knew that we needed to go beyond just this moment. We knew that our black and brown students, our queer students, our disabled students had been being targeted. And so we spent the next months actually fighting for improved due process rights for all students, ones that would stop schools from letting police, both ICE and local police, um, access our students without permission from their families. Um, so I'll just sum up to say, I think my abolitionist views of education go beyond the classroom for me, um, but also brings them back into the classroom as we confront these larger issues um, impacting our community and fight with our students and our families outside of the school building. Um, and I believe that's my work as an educator. And I believe that with, with some of my privilege as an educator comes that responsibility. Thank you, Holly. Um, and thank you for uplifting the openness to being transformed, the emphasis on collectives, um, and to really, you know, that focus on what the community really needs. Really appreciate all of that. And we're going to go ahead and pass it next to Key. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Key. My pronouns are they, them, and I am coming to you from unceded and occupied Piscataway land, which is present day Maryland, uh, where I was born and raised. I have short black hair that I just cut all the way off <laughs> today and brown skin. I have three piercings in my nose um, and small stud earrings in my ears. I'm wearing a green long sleeve button up shirt with a gold scorpion chain. And even though you cannot see her, I have uh, a pit bull laying behind me. <laughs> um, uh, but my current background are several Palestinian flags being hoisted into the air by people who are silhouetted. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's been a rough week, so please bear with me if I stumble over my words. Um, so I think that with the, the work that I do, um, I did not grow up with a political education. I grew up in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is a, a very classist suburb of, of Maryland. And um, if you know anything about Montgomery County, it is a bubble um, I think often of some semblance of protection, uh, at least it used to be. And what I mean by that is we were pretty much um, shielded from a lot based on um, the amount of wealth that this county has. And so it was always taught to me that because I grew up around every single type of person in existence, um, which is true, uh, that we just had to work hard. And I think that internalizing that um, and really intuitively knowing that this couldn't actually be true was kind of the beginnings of me um, taking the time to really deconstruct that conditioning in my life. And so when I initially um, went to college and started my work in schools and I went to college in the South. Um, and I was actually in schools in Durham, um, in schools in Carborough and Chapel Hill. Um, that was the beginning of, I think, my experiences of really understanding um, abolitionism in many ways, simply because my experiences working in schools with predominantly um, Black children and Black families really showed me that abolition is truly the only answer and will, will only ever be the only answer. Um, experiencing the unspeakable traumas 
that my families and my students endured. Um, and, you know, those of us who are educators, we also endure it, especially when we are advocating and on the side of the people that we serve and are in community with. I think that was really truly the beginning of me understanding that, like, these systems are not where it's at. Um, and, you know, working towards kind of being able to separate myself from the system. So I currently um, am an educator outside of these institutions. I left schools in 2018. Um, my last position was as an instructional coach of inquiry-based learning and a kindergarten teacher at Harlem Village Academies um, in Harlem. And I was there um, uh, teaching and coaching and then consulting for five years in total. And I made the decision to take the leap to do my own healing. Um, and it was a very painful decision. And I know a lot of people right now, because of our current circumstances with this pandemic, are uh, being pushed out of schools um, because of the trauma uh, and the lack of protection uh, that you're being offered. And so what I can say is, um, while I don't necessarily understand exactly what you're going through with COVID being in the classroom. I do understand um, having to make a really tough decision to choose uh, yourself and your health ultimately, because I knew for who I was and the standards that I had set for myself that I wasn't as good for kids as I had previously been because of my own spirit essentially being murdered because of my own trauma that I was enduring. Um, and that speaks volumes. Uh, so I am currently doing my work um, outside of the system um, with Woke Kindergarten. And so I think Woke Kindergarten is a manifestation of Dr. Love's abolitionist teaching calls to action. So I think we often talk a lot about um, uh, what abolitionist teaching is and could be. And for me, I really, I found it difficult to find um, this type of praxis in early childhood in a way um, that I could take from theory and kind of put into action. And so realize that like, you know what, you know, simply because I'm not in the classroom anymore, that doesn't mean I'm not still an educator. Uh, because as we know, schooling and education are two totally different things. And so education is constantly happening all the time, no matter where we are. And so I think my work really focuses on creating abolitionists, early childhood resources to curate opportunities for children, very young children specifically, to feel affirmed, safe, loved, and empowered and to educate their adults on how to engage with these resources to eliminate carceral logics that hopefully help to liberate our communities from the conditioning we've endured um, within this white supremacist capitalist patriarchal system. Um, so to be able to do that, I really try to understand and shed light on the many interconnected ways that the prison industrial complex manifests in early childhood. And so we see a lot of this through compliance, control, um, uh, surveillance, dehumanization, um, our systems of rewards and punishment. Uh, I think for many of us, we're often so, when we're within these institutions, it is inevitable that we are going to participate um, in this harm. And I think for some of us, we, participate in it because foundationally we think, okay, we know if our kids don't do X, Y, and Z, they're going to get in trouble. So sometimes we are operating from a place of protection or what we think is protection because we don't want anything worse to happen to them. So then we sit here and perpetuate the same type of kind of carceral logics um, uh, that are in line with their oppression. And so I think a lot of what we need to kind of think about and do first. And what I try to kind of illuminate um, with my work or my work with uh, teachers and families is to really identify like those moments um, uh, where the prison industrial complex is manifesting in real time, 
one way uh, that y'all can actually go look and do this, you know, besides, you know, having your own experiences is last summer, many children, staff, teachers, people who used to go to schools started creating Instagram pages that were black at so-and-so. So Black at Success Academy, Black at Democracy Prep. If you look at each of those experiences, that right there, that is the manifestation. And so what that meant for my work is really kind of focusing on, all right, so we know that zero tolerance exists. We know that kids and families are criminalized for truancy. We see that happening now in the middle of a pandemic. Parents who are opting to keep their children home, especially in places like New York City that don't have a remote option, um, they're being uh, punished uh, for keeping their kids home, often children who aren't old enough to receive a vaccine or be protected. So we see this in many ways. We as teachers, we're mandated reporters, which means we're ultimately agents of the state. And so what I tend to think about is as soon as children enter the, enter the school system, they are essentially treated as wards of the state, right? And so the idea here being that like, okay, we're here to kind of impart whatever knowledge, quote unquote, we have onto them. Um, and so my abolitionist visions for education are really kind of rooted in the humanness of it all, of ensuring that children, especially very young children, because we know, especially in this, <laughs> this settler state, children and elders are treated worse than any other person in existence in terms of if we're thinking about ageism and through that lens. And so I really want if schooling is a place of dehumanization, which for me, that's how it feels. Um, then I really want to create space outside of this system that feels very humanizing for children. Um, if I see that so many of my kids are trying to simply survive in schools, then I want to create space and place where my kids can thrive and see themselves thriving. And so my abolitionist visions for education are rooted um, in three kind of main ideas. Um, with Woke Kindergarten, I've created my own pedagogy um, that consists of four different components. And um, the way in which I create those resources are through these mixtapes I created. So I created this thing called a, a mixtape ecosystem. And so I created these mixtapes, resist, heal, and create. So my visions are really aligned with resistance, healing, and creation. And so on each of those mixtapes, um, I have track lists that I um, kind of do my work through. And so those track lists consist of these life affirming lenses through which I do this work, right? And so I speak to life affirming in that Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore tells us that abolition is life affirming. So I thought to myself, well, if school is spirit murdering, right, then whatever we do through an abolitionist praxis has to be life affirming. And so if I know the what of what I want the world to be and what we deserve, then I have to really work backwards to focus on the how in the process. So how am I teaching this thing? How, through which lenses am I doing this work? Um, so I really think that I... My, my overall vision um, is a space where we can understand that school is a colonial project. That is, an, is it, it was always unnatural. <laughs> we've, all, we've been learning in so many different ways um, uh, before that, and we'll continue to do that um, after. And that kids aren't just these wards of the state that school essentially kind of uh, uh, actually like targets them to be, that what if we looked at our kids as playing a really significant role in the revolution? What if we started to understand our children as comrades in this work? Because young children, um, and in my Woke Wonderings framework that's in the text, um, it is really built around the idea that young children possess the imagination, the creativity, 
the rebelliousness, right? Everything that we need to be able to create these new worlds, young children, they got it. And so what if we looked at them as what I term um, in my little mixtape ecosystem as lyricists of their own liberation? And we're not just here to impart knowledge upon them, but we're here to extract what they already inherently know and can do. And so my vision kind of for, you know, abolitionist education is to really um, help our children understand that they are self-determined participants in this work um, and that we will get to these new words, uh, not in, in this hierarchical fashion, but we are in community with children and that they uh, also understand that um, they have these inherent gifts that are going to be to essentially lead the way. Thank you so much, Key. Um, that was beautiful. I was trying to pull out the a couple of the threads, but that was so rich and there's so much. Um, I wanna appreciate you for highlighting your journey to abolition, um, speaking to choosing yourself, uh, health and community during these difficult times, um, and really a vision of abolitionist teaching, early childhood praxis that's rooted in um, young people being affirmed, safe, loved, empowered, um, and how we can, as educators, really perpetuate these systems. Um, and, you know, this treatment of young people as ward of the states and the perpetuation of carceral logics. Um, you know, thinking about abolitionist practices, life affirming, kids role in the revolution, there's so much there. So just really appreciate um, appreciate you and appreciate those offerings. So now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Osceola. All right, peace everybody. My name is Osceola Ward. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. And just to provide a visual description of myself, I'm a light-skinned young black brother. Uh, I got hair that on a good day goes down to my shoulders. It's kind of curly. Um, I also have this shirt. Shout out to Marie Kondo. It brings me a lot of joy. It is emerald green. Um, it has some neon trimmings. And if you pay close attention, you could see some white magenta uh, and yellow lines running across it. In my background, it's kind of light, but I am sitting out on my mother's patio on uh, unseated um, occupied Muwekma Ohlone land. All right, um, man, it's just a blessing to be here. It feels amazing to be in communication with so many folks who are committed to liberation and imagining uh, a more liberatory future. When I think about an abolitionist view of education, first and foremost, I situate myself as a keeper of memory, of ancestral memory. Now, it's not something that I created, it's something that I inherited, right? These ideas or notions don't originate within me, they are uh, the result of protracted, indefatigable struggle by my people, uh, African people. And so in saying that, I think it's important to trace that genealogy a little bit, right? The origin of civilization and teaching begins on the African continent. And I think that's so important to remember because in this day and age, we still have teachers trying to convince black children and other children that they come from people who are ahistorical or that they have to be something that they are not in order to succeed. Um, and so what's really important to me to keep in mind is yes, we can center carceral logics and we can center the oppressive conditions that our people are forced to live under these histories that continue to reinvent themselves. But what's also important is to recognize the genealogy and history of abolition and the central aim of abolition, which is to restore right relationship. I think on a very central level, these institutions like prisons, like detention centers, like nation states work to define who is worthy and valuable and remove them from relationship, relationship with their family, relationship with their loved ones, relationship with the land, and a relationship with memory, 
right? People are literally disappeared from their communities. And that serves as a way to fracture memory, relationship and connection. So when I think about my journey, there's a really poignant story of memory and connection to memory. Uh, as has been previously mentioned, my hometown is proudly East Palo Alto, California, and it will remain that way until the day that I die. East Palo Alto has an extremely important history. Now, I was born in the year 1993. In 1992, uh, the year before I was born, East Palo Alto was declared the murder capital of the country. And that is oftentimes the reputation that precedes my city. This idea that is a veritable hellhole in which all anti-black stereotypes can be projected. And all of the children that come from there, all of the people that come from there inherit that tradition. And so that is something that I carried with a great deal of shame for the majority of my childhood. So much so that I suppressed all of the transformative and liberatory experiences that I had there until I was in college and I was sitting in a class and the professor said, you're from East Palo Alto, California, home of Nairobi College. I didn't know this history. This is something that was denied me. I was part of a school busing program and it was constantly reinforced upon me the idea that my city produced essentially nothing but animals that needed to be contained. We needed gun control, right? We needed N-word control, to, to put it lightly. And so, not so lightly. Um, that was something that I carried with me. But when this professor said that, he gave me access to memory that liberated me, that allowed me to see myself in a new way. And what I learned was that Nairobi College was an initiative in the 1960s that was envisioned by radical Black folks who wanted something different for their children. That's Bob Hoover. that's Gertrude Wilkes. They imagined a liberatory education that would be accessible to everyone that would take place in backyards and garages, that would be attended by Stanford professors and professors and students from around the diaspora, that would be multiracial, that would be uh, focused on international solidarity, and that would respond to the needs of the community. Now, this wasn't an idea that came down or was handed down in a PD or from a, a professor somewhere else. This was something that was imagined by the impoverished residents of this unincorporated city, right? East Palo Alto wasn't incorporated until 1983. Now, many would say that that effort failed because it fizzled um, in the early 80s, which then gave way to the crack epidemic um, that would mark the lives of, of many people of that city, including my own family, right? Um, but what is so important to know is that memory lives on. Right. I think in Western culture, if you go to a cemetery and you look at a headstone, you will see two dates. Right. You will see a, a birth date with a dash in the middle that signifies the life in between and then the terminus, um, which would be the end of life. And oftentimes we project that view onto our movements, onto our heroes and leaders. We have this assumption that these movements, these conceptions, these imaginations died, that they perished, that they failed, that they didn't succeed because we're not experiencing liberation and freedom now, but that is not true. These movements and struggles live on through us. And that is why it is so important we reconnect with our traditions because relationship is defined so differently in indigenous cultures. And so when I'm speaking to my young people when I'm speaking to myself, right, because teaching is very much a spiritual practice, not only are you trying to cultivate young people, but you are very much being cultivated by them and cultivating yourself. There is a way in wholeness that we are in divine relationship. We are in divine relationship with a higher power that gives us purpose. Now that can be many things across the diaspora. Sometimes those are referred to as Orisha, as Loa, as God, as Allah or it may just be human goodness, right? That is so important that we learn how to connect our young people with that higher power, with this idea that there is something operating on your behalf beyond what we can see. And oftentimes I tell them, imagine your ancestors who were enslaved for over 400 years, that one who was born in that 200 point middle mark, whose great grandparents were enslaved and whose grandchildren will be enslaved. If they had not continued to struggle, our people would not know 
nominal, but freedom now. It is in that faith, that faith that my struggle transcends my physical life and that I am guarded and sustained by a a power higher than me that keeps us grounded. I think that is so important to impart in, in young people to cultivate in young people so that they know that the fact that they woke up this morning means that they have a divine purpose and calling. And it's not material pursuits. It's not anything you're gonna see on TV but it made your existence possible here. The other thing is to think about relationship around us, right? How are we in relationship with the people that we love and care about? How are we in relationship and the people we are in class with? How are you in relationship with the people that you walk uh, across on a daily basis, right? We live in a very highly isolating society, I think. You know, Marx said that capitalism produces alienation, right? People become alienated from their work. They become alienated from each other. And so it's about restoring that relationship to each other. How do we build empathy and understanding in our classrooms? A lot of times those blockages come from the same carceral logics that we are talking about. We live in a society where it is understood that certain people are disposable that seven children and an aid worker can be bombed by a predator drone and it's just the news topic for the day. That is a practice that we need to cultivate because we are continually taught, right? We turn on the TV, we see seven people die every minute just from program. We need to actively combat that by developing love for other people and understanding of other people's struggle. But that oftentimes is blocked. Remember I said that abolition is addressing the things that block relationship, connection. That is oftentimes blocked by extremely low self-esteem because we live in such a racist, heteropatriarchal, sexist society that teaches people that their very essence and being, their emotions, their gender expression, their racial identity, their language is worthless or that it's something that needs to be fundamentally changed. So if you cannot accept or love that part of yourself, how could you love another? Well, that's where affirmations are so important. Affirmations that bring in this notion of self-love and acceptance of oneself, that evaluate those barriers, that teach us to read media critically so that we can safeguard our spirits and conception of self. Now, that relational direction also extends downward into the creation that we so abundantly enjoy. Relationship with land. How are we getting our young people out into the world? Are we teaching them the joy of cultivating and growing their own food? Are we teaching them how to play outside? Are we teaching them to think about and imagine all the different animal species out there, right? I'm still a person that walks around with jeans with grass stains on them, right? Because I'm looking for blood, bugs, turning over rocks. I still have that joy and passion. That's something we have to connect our young people with. Another thing that's extremely important is to think about the future generations. Are we orienting our young people to be in connection with the future? to imagine the consequences of their actions today and how it will impact the next seven generations or that after that. I think that's extremely important as well. And lastly, is our ancestors. Unfortunately, as black people, we have a lot of ancestors, many who have become ancestors far too early. And so there are official state sanctioned um, showings of grief, which are often cheap, and used to push a political agenda. And then there is the grief that is naturally occurring, right? Our young people have their own indigenous practices of grief. In San Francisco, oftentimes you'll see lanyards with the laminated um, funeral program or memory card of 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 a loved one that has transitioned that young people wear every single day because it means that much to them to remember their ancestors. You'll see airbrushed t-shirts with a loved one's visage on there because remembrance and memory is so important. How are we creating space for our young people to grieve and to affirm that black life and lost life does indeed matter? That's the importance of grief. And so making space is able to restore relationship. And that becomes very important when we are addressing the arms of the state. 
because we live in the wealthiest country in human history. And it has devised and developed mechanisms of oppression that we have never seen before, that have impacted us in ways that are quite frankly unimaginable. When I think about young people that have lost, some of them, everyone in their family to a disease like COVID, which is a failure of, of public health along racial, class, and, and ableist lines. We think about young people who have more loved ones incarcerated than they do free with them. We have young ones who have family members or themselves are being deported. These things can be extremely overwhelming and totalizing. And so we need to explore those, but what we also need to explore is the importance of relationship. How do we build and restore relationships so that we can build movements that don't end, that live beyond us because they are sustained by the love that animates our community and very being. So I think the last point I wanna make is I just wanna to return to the history of my people. When we think about abolition, I think it's extremely important that we recognize as Vincent Harding said, that this is a river that has flown down to us and is still carrying us forward, right? And abolition is birthed as enslavement begins, right? As the first Africans are snatched up in the 15th century from the coast of West Africa, abolition is born because there are people who say, no, you cannot affect our relationships like this. You cannot take our loved ones from us. You cannot destroy and denude our country as you engage in this monoculture and take all the soil and nutrients from our land. And from that point, people allow themselves to be transformed. Sorry, that's my great cat, Lumumba. He's joining the party. Um, he's also agreeing with what I have to say. Their lives are being transformed by this imposition of uh, you know, a white supremacist global order. And so in that they allow themselves to be transformed. They go from being Mende people, they go from being Bambada, Yoruba, Hausa people to forming a collective identity that allows for transformative relationships and identities that allow for a challenging of white supremacist logics, right? When African people are dragged to this country, they employ the resources that exist in their own country and own cultural knowledge to pursue freedom. They establish maroon colonies, colonies that exist outside of the schools, outside of um, the slave economy itself to maintain those cultural connections and those freedoms. And I think that's something that we have to begin to think about again. How do we allow ourselves to be transformed to facilitate loving relationship and connection, not only with ourselves, with our higher power, with our ancestors, with our, but with each other as well. So thank you. Thank you, Osceola. Um, that was so powerful. And I really just want to uplift the way that you were talking about the practice of uh, disposability that so many of us are taught um, and how we really uh, need to cultivate that practice of abolition, um, including uh, re being restoring being in right relation through aboli abolition, through access to memory, um, through joy and through connection and orientation to future generations. Just really appreciate all of our panelists um, and appreciate all the connections between um, the way that collectives are being imagined with organizers, with um, organizing with uh, young people across generations uh, with the divine. So just really appreciate you all. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Stephanie for our next question. Um, and I echo Christy even more, you know, there's uh, just so much richness here and so much knowledge. So thank you to Ki, Asiola, and Holly. Uh, I want to bring us back to something, Ki, you mentioned about us knowing the what. We already know the what of what we want. Um, and so it's about working backwards and thinking about the how, how it happens. And, you know, organizations and people remind us that abolition is both a long-term vision as well as a current practice. And so I wanna invite each of you to share one teaching or learning practice that might be of interest to fellow educators. 
And um, just being mindful of time, let's try to do this within, have everybody have their response in maybe three to four minutes. But the invitation is to think of, uh, to share one teaching or learning practice that might be of interest to educators. And we'll go, we'll begin with Osceola and then have Holly share and then Key. Yeah, sorry, I'm long-winded, y'all. My name is Asiola. Um, I really wanted to focus in on the practice of grief as a really transformative tool. Um, as I mentioned, our students, our families, our communities already have their own liberatory uh, traditions of grief. But oftentimes, we don't make space for that in our classrooms. Actually, most of the time, we don't acknowledge grief. And grief is a necessary part of the human experience, right? We look across all cultures in the world, they have developed some way of memora uh, commemorating ancestors or loved ones that have transitioned and passed on. And so I think there is a cruel irony when we say Black Lives Matter, but then we don't make space to grieve those that have been lost, right? And so for me, something that I do every single year at the start of the year, and this is something that I learned from a brilliant educator named Tashango and Billy Shaka, so I wanna pass that on, um, that this is something that I inherited as well, um, is asking young people, who is a loved one that has passed on, that has really invested in your education? And if it's not somebody from your family that you feel comfortable sharing, it could be a, a, a popular figure that means something to you. And so I ask young people to go think on that. And when they come back, we share about it. But before we share about it, we create space and we talk about the importance of grief and we pour libations, right? And we talk about how grief and you know the tears that we shed nourish life. Right, that that is a necessary process that sustains us. And through that opportunity, everybody as they are comfortable is able to share the ancestor. We, we pass sage around, right? We um, use the Tibetan gong to set the mood, introducing these traditions to them in ways of remembrance. And then this becomes something that we do every month and have a standing altar in the classroom where young people can leave their loved one or a sign of their loved one, maybe a drink that their loved one enjoyed, a snack that they liked, a picture of them, a poem that they would have read to them. And this becomes a standing altar and centerpiece that we can also add, unfortunately, the many images of black and brown people who have been victims of the state too. This becomes a humanizing way of engaging with the fact that our life expectancies are cut short by these systems of oppression but that in memory, we never die. And it becomes a commitment to transformative change. And it becomes a reminder, right? When we make space for this in the classroom every day, that we have a responsibility to those that have transitioned and passed on, that we are being watched over and guided, and that there are people who are very much invested in us bringing our brilliance, our excellence, our humility and heart to the learning process every single day. So I think that's my time, I'll pass. Thank you, Asiola. Holly, I'll pass it to you. Great, this is Holly again. Um, I, yeah, I want to lift up um, the focus that Asiola was talking about, about relationships. Um, and I think that that's, that's so central to my practice as an educator, a teaching practice um, in that, in just slowing down my classroom um, space, which I think can be so hard in a public school environment when we're given standard after standard, um, but really slowing it down um, in order to create chances to experience community to get there. Um, I think one really important thing for me is to make sure students um, is, is bringing in current movement leaders and organizers um, into the classroom um, and seeing those, those relationships and having access to their community in, in new ways, to those same relationships that, that I may have built. Um, and so I think so often in our elementary and middle school classrooms, we see um, a a picture presented of a world that's like already reached the point we want, um, that movement work is something that's in the past, um, that the people that we talk about 
seem often unattainable or are famous um, and not something that students can relate to. Um, and so I know uh, right before the pandemic, I was teaching fourth and fifth grade and we had a project where I brought um, our class split into groups and learned about lots of different um, black movement leaders um, in our city and our state um, and throughout the South particularly folks that I knew I could bring into the classroom um, in some way and groups decided who they were interested in looking at. Um, and so like one group chose Mary Hooks who at the time was co-director of Southerners on New Ground and they looked at her work with the Black Mamas Bell Out. Um, and so many students had experience with um, having a, a someone in their lives who was incarcerated. So to hear about uh, someone doing this work, I think was so important. Another group focused on Bernetta Austin, um, who is a queer um, representative in the North Carolina House. Um, but before she was in the North Carolina House, um, she worked to represent folks on death row. Um, so we were cut short by the closing of schools with the pandemic, but they started to get to meet some of these people, um, which I think was so powerful to meet them and see that see people working towards liberation. And I think providing that balance between struggle and joy. So approaching some of these harder issues um, that students are aware about and know about going on, um, but by building these new relationships and community um, and getting to have that chance to have access to them. Um, and that these are people that, that are, you know, like just one of us. And then also like building that conversation further and talking about who in our families, who in our communities um, that we can bring in, that we might not have other people in the classroom might not know about. So lifting up people in our own lives, that it's not just that I have this access to certain people, but we all have access to people doing amazing work. Um, and I think in teaching middle schoolers, um, it's been even diving further into some of the organizing related to the issues, not just like the topic or and going even beyond the people. So understanding those organizing relationships. Um, I know we said pre pandemic, um, one of our units um, in science was on pandemics um, and it meant for me, including documentaries like how to survive a plague um, and looking at how not all issues of science are approached equally um, studying climate change really centering the voices of indigenous people um, using a lot of materials from rethinking schools but um, I want to share one one piece that happened when studying climate change that um, like has continued to push me as an educator um, is that we I probably 2015 2016 um, I was working with a particular class of seventh and eighth graders who really thinking back it's it's five five or so years ago really we're grappling with the idea of black lives matter like across students across race questioning that phrase versus all lives matter like really digging into that 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 phrase some of them hearing that for the first time at that point um and it was really during our climate lessons um and thinking about lives of indigenous folks we looked at articles from Naomi Klein on why Black Lives Matter should transform the whole climate debate. Um, that students, I think, really were starting to grasp the idea that those most affected by climate were those who were impacted on a daily basis. And those people were Black people, Indigenous people, people of color. Um, and those were also the groups that had emitted the least carbon. And so it was really interesting to see students really tackle that issue in science, um, which went well past maybe what standards we were supposed to be on. Um, but it was it was bringing up so so many important things in our classroom um, that they agreed like the solutions around climate change would benefit all but of course would affect some people more than other. And it was like an aha moment for so many of the students um, who had like been grappling with that idea, the larger idea of Black Lives Matter that was kind of just just coming into, into the picture around us at that time as centering those lives who, who are most affected by oppression and how anti-Black racism affects Black lives every single day. Um, and I think they really saw that through climate um, to, to like understand that in an even larger picture. Um, so I think both bringing in real people, real organizing, real issues into my classroom um, is just, is so critical in thinking about um, abolition, both in a long-term way and a, and a 
a short term current practice. Um, even even if, like I said, it means not having time for all the standards or or like having to rethink some of them. Sometimes there's one standard during that unit where it has students look very individualistically. Like it, it's like how do students focus on their like individual actions, like turning off lights, not using straws. And I present it to students and I'm like, let's break this down. Like, is this really where our focus needs to be? Um, so yeah, I think I think knowing something key said was that kids are kids are our comrades like knowing that students have that knowledge that power trusting in them um and then connecting them to people doing the work now thank you so much holly i'll pass it to key hi everyone this is key um i'll try to keep it short so we can get to the last question um i think a lot of um, of my practice is really around wondering. And so um, I think it's really important that we create space for kids to be able to wonder about, you know, um, a different reality. Um, but to move beyond that, I think part of our practice really should be uh, wondering more about what kids are wondering. We have to really do that more often, right? We need to actually sit and wonder about what kids are wondering and create space for them to share those wonderings, right? And we can get real meta with it. But this is really important to me, especially with young children, because, you know, oftentimes kids don't really end up having a say in how the school day goes, right? Like, even how life goes, right? And so as educators, you know, as teachers, um, some teachers go into classrooms specifically because they want someone to control. And so part of being able to maintain and harbor that control is to never ask children how they're feeling or what they're thinking about what we've been doing all day. So we need to wonder more about what kids are wondering and create that space for them to share it with us. Like, well, what did you think? You know, I, I, you know, modeling, you know, I wonder what, what you were wondering about earlier when we were doing X, Y, and Z during writing, right? Talk with kids, you know, make it a practice, you know, if you can incorporate it at the end of your day when you're, you're closing out, um, to really reflect back on the day and give kids space to tell you how they felt about how the day went, you know, what they liked and disliked, what they might have been wondering about, ask them about their process, right? Whenever they were, you know, engaged in something that you were doing during the day. But this also requires us to be able to teach into uh, uh, thriving and what that means. Because we want kids to be able to wonder in a way that actually resists kind of buying into the things that we're just imparting upon them. Like if we're, if, if today we only had like 15 minutes of recess or like math time, of course, because everybody puts everything in into blocks, right? Math time, just like we were doing worksheets or something. Kids need to be able to pinpoint when something actually doesn't contribute to their thriving. And that requires us to relinquish a lot of control because a lot of people don't want to hear that the day was trash, <laughs> right? And we need our, even our, our youngest kids, especially because they're the ones that, that'll tell you like it is. We need them to be able to feel safe enough to share with us what they would have changed, what they might be wondering about, I wonder why we had to do it this way and not that way. We need to be able to sit and ask kids essentially like for some type of evaluation of how things are going <laughs> so that we can take that, th that knowledge and, 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 and that essentially giftedness that they're sharing with us, these gifts that they're sharing with us, these offerings to be able to then reflect back and be like, hold up we have some things that we need to shift and change. And then how can we do that together? How can we create this space together? 
right? We need to create our own realm of learning and what can that look like, but we won't ever know if we go day in and day out and we don't wonder about what kids are wondering. So that's really what I, in a nutshell, want us to really think about because I'm constantly wondering about what babies are wondering, what toddlers are wondering, what preschoolers are wondering constantly, right? And we need to be able to create safe enough space collectively for kids to be able to share those wonderings so that we can curate and cultivate the type of community and environments that our kids deserve. Thank you so much and for to each of you for sharing those practices and how sharing with other educators of this call, uh, the viewers to know how they can uh, share, implement, think about abolitionist education in the now. Uh, thank you to Osceola for lifting up the importance of remembering our ancestors in learning spaces and holding space for, for memories. And Holly, thank you for uplifting the importance of creating space for community and with community and bringing in real people and real situations to uh, students. And then Key, thank you for pointing out the importance of wonder in this, in this work and wondering what kids are wondering and creating space for kids to share their wonders as well. Um, I have Kirstie, Kirstie close us out with a, a final question. Wonderful, thank you all. Um, our final round is going to be a lightning round. Um, and I also just realized that we never held up the publication. So all of our panelists tonight, you can find them in Lessons in Liberation um, and learn more from the tremendous work that they're up to. So just wanting to um, uplift that. And so we're going to do our final round as a lightning round for everybody. So we're going to try to take about a minute to answer the question, what advice would you give to educators grappling with this work? So how to build this work, how to engage, engage with the toolkit, um, however you wanna answer that. And the order we're gonna go in today is Key, Asiola, and then Holly. This is Key uh, again. Um, so I would say grapple with your life. <laughs> Grapple with the language that you're using. Grapple with the everyday ways you're waking up and committing to abolition. Because, you know, abolition isn't just like a pedagogical praxis, it's a life praxis. And so if we can't figure out the ways or kind of understand the ways that we're committing to abolition in our everyday lives and how we react and respond to people and how grief manifests and how we're you know pursuing our own healing how we're reconnecting to spirit or really acknowledging a lot of the trauma and pain that we've endured and and how we kind of react and respond to the ways in which other people's pain and trauma are manifesting then we won't be able to do this work in the classroom. So we have to really grapple with the ways in which we're committing to abolition on the everyday. Um, and what I really appreciated about Osceola and what he was saying is that so much of my life has existed around a sort of loneliness because my family is from Newport News and my grandma is the only one who left. And so my ancestors were enslaved. And part of my practice every day is to try and do what I can to restore relationship to my ancestors. That's part of me committing and recommitting to abolition every day. And that means I gotta sit and take the time and speak to my elders and reach out and do the, the, the research that this requires as well. But this is part of it. Um, and I'll leave you with something that might on the surface seem like, oh, this is silly, but every single thing to be able to really think about how we're committing to abolition in our everyday lives, right? As a life praxis, we have to acknowledge that everything is deep. Everything is deep. And capitalism moves so fast, it doesn't allow us to, it, it, it creates this like, it's very shallow. And we aren't able to actually you know, face the depths of our experiences because it just continues to move and it's it's so so urgent 
And we need to be able to understand how deep things are so we can put our floaties on and our life jackets and really sit and wade in that water a little bit. So to be able to really do that, we have to start thinking like, wait, hold up, that's really deep. And I'll share this last thing. So if you live in any type of city, especially, you see those speed cameras that are that that are clacking us every single block, right? Um, and so this tool of surveillance is, you know, what police use to ensure that we got to pay all types of money. It criminalizes us. We can get points, all these things. So sometimes, right, I'll sit and I'll be like, you know what? F these speed cameras, like, how dare they surveil? Like, this is da-da-da-da, right? But I'm going to slow down because I don't want a ticket. So I slow down. I'm mad about it. You know, I'm slowing down. And then suddenly someone zooms right past me. Many of our reactions would be, you know what? That's why the camera's going to go off. You out here speeding. You know, the can- it's going they going to get you. And then we got to check ourselves. This is what I mean that everything is deep. This was a profound moment for me, like back in the day when I realized, hold up. I refuse to kind of do this kind of justification work that the state wants me to do. Simply because I said, you know what? I don't agree with this. I'm going to slow down because I don't want this to happen to me, right? That doesn't mean that this person speeding then deserves to get that flashed. Because if I decide that surveillance on any level ain't the wave, then I can't sit here and be excited that they're going to get penalized or punished for it. And I only share that specifically because it seems like a like, oh, whatever, it's a small moment. But that's a big moment. That's deep, right? That I can't sit here and justify this for someone else simply because I decided to engage in this way. Surveillance is surveillance regardless. And so I need to denounce it at all costs, right? So that's really what I want to leave you with is really thinking about how we're reacting in our everyday to people that we should really be in community with and comradeship with? What are our values? Are our values in alignment with what we're not only just saying, because a lot of people talk a lot of game, but how are we creating an actionable value alignment? What does that look like, right? What does that look like, feel like, sound like in our every day? Thank you, and we're going to pass it over to Asiola. Peace, everybody. Asiola here. Um, I think it's really important to uh, practice self-reflection, something that I do every day. Uh, I sit with my journal and I ask myself three questions. Was I resentful today? Was I dishonest? Or was I selfish? And I think um, in that practice, It's not perfect all the time, but it can help me gain awareness into the deeper impacts that living in the society we live in have on me. I think another thing is that a lot of us are addicted to fear and oftentimes throwing ourselves at big and overwhelming problems allows us to feel the hopelessness that is so familiar and comfortable to us as oppressed and marginalized people. And that's not a place that we can stay because that's not where transformation occurs. That's where burnout and hopelessness and resentment develop, resentment towards our people, resentment towards the movements that we are a part of. And so we have to constantly monitor ourselves and know that we are worthy of breaks, that we are worthy of love, and that our young people are too. Thank you for the time, peace. Thank you, and over to Holly. Yeah, um, this is Holly. Um, As a white educator, for other white educators out there, I think we have to be brave as we work to dismantle the system. And sometimes I think that means being willing to put our jobs on the line to do what's right. So not in a performative way, but in everyday ways. So like speaking out against a magnet system or a gifted program that's inherently privileging our white students and families, fighting for language justice, even when it's, we know that that's not easy or creates more work. Um, working alongside families to disrupt an ableist system, um, which often looks like that segregates dis- disabled students. So for me, that often looks like an IEP meetings, being supportive of those families, even when what they're asking is not what I know my school or system wants to do. Um, And then I think also 
just everything that we say or don't say to our student students is communicating our values. Um, so some of my work and what I challenge you is like thinking about the ways we speak to our students. And I think during online learning, I actually feel really proud of um, getting into a better practice of apologizing to my students when things weren't presented very clearly um, and for also lifting them up frequently for their resilience. And I was truly just so proud of them um, constantly. And I tried to tell them that more. And I think I've carried that into the classroom. And then la lastly, this year in the classroom, I think I've been focusing a lot on consent. I think because we've been not in a physical space together for so long um, that really that sharing physical space feels even more important. And so I try to give them the tools to do things, but if I like, if it feels helpful for me to help work out a problem or show them something on their Chromebook, I'm like saying, may I type this on your Chromebook? May I use your pencil to show you a problem? So even though those are just small things, is it okay if I pull up a chair beside you? Um, and I realize I, and acknowledge I have a different level of power um, in my role when I ask this, but I still believe it's so important than just simply taking over a space or item um, that's there as a teacher. And so, I think for those of us grappling with this work to dismantle the system, um, it also finally means to make sure that I'm putting collective energy into changing these structures. So I do all of these things in my classroom and then at the same time, trying to look at these overarching structures. Um, so putting in protections, we've worked to put in protections for teachers as organizers um, has been a really big and important thing that I know we've done here in Durham. Um, and so I think those things are possible in other places as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Holly, Osceola, and Key, again, um, for your amazing gems that you shared this evening. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of love that I've seen in the chat. Uh, and I also want to thank all of the people who uh, helped to make today possible. There's a wonderful team of folks who've helped to organize this event. And so thank you to the organizers as well. Um, we want to invite folks, uh, there is in the chat a link, it'll, it'll be reshared to a community Padlet. This is where you can share an important takeaway or an idea that you're leaving with today that helps you to integrate abolitionist education in your teaching practice. And so we're just inviting you to share that uh, if you feel comfortable on that public board. Uh, and also to keep it with you and meditate on it in the weeks and months to come as you continue this important work. I'll pass it to Chrissy to close us out. Yes, thank you all. And thank you for your thoughts and reflections on the Padlet. And thank you to our team who's been working behind the scenes to make this event run smoothly. If you want to rewind, rewatch or share today's panel, it will be available on the YouTube and Facebook pages of Critical Resistance and the Free Minds, Free People site of the Education for Liberation Network. Please join us and spread the word about our upcoming webinar on Students for Abolition, which will be Tuesday, October 26th at four o'clock Pacific. You can register now at Lessons in liberation students.eventbrite.com. That's lessons in liberation students.eventbrite.com. Uh, we're really excited. We're going to have uh, young people from HALA, Project What, Rise, and Defund CPD. And uh, please stay tuned for a follow up email with opportunities for engagement and resources. And again, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. Good night, everyone.